Our scripture is from Genesis 16, verses 1 through 10. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. She also said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children, so sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living with in Canaan for 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she is, knows that she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And the slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar so that she fled from Egypt. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road of Shut. He said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord said, told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. May God add his blessing to this spiritual fight. As we look into another event in the lives of Abraham and Sarah, it may appear that I'm just picking out bad stuff, all the negative things they did. Um, as I said last week, I think it's important to just get them off the pedestal and to examine some of these darker sides of, of these biblical heroes because we all have that darker side, don't we? And we can certainly apply what God taught Abraham and Sarah to our own lives. And yes, there are many positive things that Abraham and Sarah did which set an example for us, and we will look at some more of those things next week. But we need to learn those what not to do things in our walk with the Lord, just as much as we need to learn what we should be doing. Well, this story is an example of what not to do. <laughs> it seems that we don't learn those things very well, because even though very few of us would be in the same situation that Abraham and Sarah were, still we keep repeat, repeating the same kinds of mistakes that Abraham and Sarah did so long ago. So what is it that they did? Well, again, Abraham and Sarah found themselves faced with a dilemma. I've heard people say that, that they just long for simpler days when, when our lifestyles were not so complicated and, and we didn't have so many problems. But you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, people have had problems. They've had dilemmas to work through where they had to, to choose between living by faith or trying some other way. And as complicated as our problems seem to be today, most of them can't come down to the same issue, don't they? Do I let God take control of my life? or do I take matters into my own hands? And that was Abraham and Sarah's question to answer. They did have a predicament. God said that they would have children. And not only that, but that they would begin what would become a great nation. Now they were 75 and 65 years old, respectively, at the time. It was already an absurd enough notion at the time. And now 10 years had passed and still no children. And you can almost see the wheels turning in their heads what they were thinking. Maybe we misunderstood what God was saying, or, or maybe he didn't really mean that we would have children, or maybe he wants us to figure out how to make this happen. And after all, it would take a miracle for his promise to actually come true. And that was precisely the point. It would take a miracle. Did they have the faith to believe that God could work that miracle? And I believe they did have that faith eventually, or it never would have happened. But at this particular point, they chose expedience over faith. 
they decided to take matters into their own hands and to speed things along a little bit. As we see in verse 1, that Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So Sarah suggested that Abraham try to have a child with one of her handmaidens, who was named Hagar. Hagar may very well have been one of those servants that were obtained from the Egyptian pharaoh after their deception in Egypt that we talked about last week. And Hagar was younger than Sarah, still in her childbearing years, and someone who could be a surrogate mother of the promised child who was supposed to, to start a great new nation. Now, surrogate motherhood is something that is practiced occasionally even today, and it's becoming more and more common. It's quite controversial, and although it's more and more accepted all the time, most Christians that I know of don't accept it as something that God would have us to do and consider it to be something that, that was quite bizarre. But in Abraham's day, it actually was a totally accepted practice. Nobody would have seen anything at all strange or wrong about Abraham having a, a child with a servant girl. They even had laws uh, about surrogate motherhood, uh, which said that, that Sarah could then adopt the child and, and call it her own. And so logically, we can all see this seemed to be the perfect solution to their little problem here. They were supposed to have a child. Sarah's too old. So get a younger woman to have it in her place. Problem solved. Well, just because something is socially acceptable does not mean that God approves of it or that it is any reason at all to divert from the path that he has set us on. There's so many behaviors that are not even questioned in our society. They're just accepted as options of how people choose to live. Now, maybe 50 years ago, there was a lot more stigma of disapproval about some of these things, like uh, uh, th th things that we're talking about. Even though they were still practiced 50 years ago, there was more of a disapproval about them. But uh, today, nobody even seems to care about things like premarital sex or, or unmarried couples living together or, or babies being born out of wedlock or people getting divorced and remarried multiple times. Nobody seems to be bothered in the slightest by any of these things anymore. Homosexual behavior is now something that's not only accepted and approved of, but it is encouraged and, and uh, promoted, and uh, people are educated about it so that the public knows all about it. And to even insinuate that such behavior might be sinful or something that God would disapprove of will get you called a lot of awful names. You know, the kindest being ignorant and intolerant and narrow-minded and, and hateful and the worst being the worst kind of language you can imagine. See, but none of that changes the fact that these things are sinful and that God does disapprove of them. He doesn't hate the people who do them. He loves them so much he sent his son to die for them. But he does hate the sin. These things are wrong. They're not God's way. And just because something might be expedient or easier or more convenient doesn't mean it's God's way. In fact, God's way is usually not the expedient or the convenient or the easy way. But it's always the best way. And in the long run, it's always best to follow God's way. Now, people think that they know better and that they're so enlightened and that they know so much. But all the time, God the Father knows best. And God the Father wants what is best for his children. And he can be trusted to give his best counsel. His commandments are always right. Now, by saying they're right, I'm not just saying that they're the opposite of wrong, which is true, but they're right for us. They're right for our lives. They're right for what would make our lives what God wants them to be, even if it's not always convenient or, or easy. They're right because God loves us and he wants our lives to be right. But Abraham and Sarah probably felt that they had been patient long enough and that it was time to get things rolling. They didn't seek the Lord's counsel before they did this thing. What they did, although we might be able to understand why they did it, but what they did was wrong. And it only led to more problems, many more problems. Likewise, when we act without praying, without trusting in God's commandments and about what he said is the best way to go, when we act without seeking his will, we're just asking for trouble to come. And really what happened next is symbolic of man's condition as a whole. We all have a dilemma, a dilemma of sin, which forces us into a position of either choosing faith, trusting in God's way of dealing with that dilemma, or expediency, 
you know, some other way, some way that, that we think would be easier for finding a solution. And since God's way is the only good way, then any other way is a false way. Any other way turns us into phonies. We're deceived into thinking that we've got the answer when all we've got is trouble. And so here's what happened. Hagar did get pregnant, and because of that, her attitude towards Sarah began to change. Verse 4 says that she began to despise her mistress. I think we can understand how that would happen. She began to feel superior to Sarah. We, we can picture the change in attitude when she started carrying Abraham's baby, which, which Sarah wasn't able to do. And we can just picture that, 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 that look of despising. Now, who's the servant now? You know, I've got it over you. And uh, that, that everything changed when, when this all happened. And so at this change of attitude, Sarah then regretted the whole decision. Verse 5 says, Then Sarah said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Sarah's saying she didn't agree to this just so that this servant girl could take an attitude and shove it in her face that, uh, that she couldn't have children. And so she blamed Abraham for it even though the whole thing was her idea from the first place. So she may have said, well, why did you even listen to me? You know, you didn't have to listen to me. Now, right now, all the men are thinking, just like a woman. <laughs> and so Abraham reacts by crumbling under the pressure and by abdicating any responsibility in the matter, as we see in verse 6. It says, your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. So Abraham's thinking, hey, I'm just a third party here. You know, it's not my fault. If you don't like Hagar, then you deal with her. Just leave me out of it. I'm not responsible. And right now all the women are thinking, just like a man. <laughs> and now everything's a mess. And Sarah began to mistreat Hagar to the point where Hagar just took off out of there. And all of a sudden, because of the utter phoniness of the whole situation, that false sense of security that you have when you try to do things without God, and, and you try to convince yourself that you're doing fine just relying on your own resources and your own ideas that are very different from God's. Everything about this situation was phony. Hagar had a false superiority on, uh, based on her pregnancy, just like many people today feel a superiority over those who are just simple-minded and live by faith and simple trust. Sarah had a false interest she pretended to be interested in fulfilling the Lord's promise when all she was really doing was just looking after her own interests. And many people today pretend to be interested in spiritual things and in serving the Lord through the church, but all they're really interested in is what they can get out of it. You know, personal gain, personal attention, personal recognition. It's a false interest. Sarah then blamed Abraham when things didn't work out the way she wanted. Abraham was guilty, of course, but Sarah had no business just blaming him. It was her idea. This was a false blame. And this is what many people do when they are confronted with the consequences of their, their sin. They look to, to shift the blame onto someone or something else. And even if there is someone else to blame, it's still a false blame because each of us has to account to God for ourselves and for our own actions. And then Abraham had this false neutrality. I'm not involved in this. You know, do what you want, Sarah. Just leave me out of it. We see later that Abraham was the one who named his son, that he was responsible for his actions, but we, we see the, his attempt to just be neutral about it all. And so many people try this false neutrality when it comes to their faith in God. I don't feel strongly either way. You know, I'm neutral. You know, I don't want to be one of those religious fanatics, but, oh, there might be a God. I'm, I'm agnostic. You, know. see, you can't be neutral when it comes to following the Lord. That's just a, a phony way of trying to deal with your faith. So I have to ask, what about you? Are you trying to get by with one of these false reactions to faith? Do you have a false superiority? Have you convinced yourself that you're just kind of a step above other people because of your particular station in life? Do you have a false interest in spiritual and, and noble things because it makes you look good and because it makes you feel good about yourself? Do you project a false blame on other people or other circumstances because it keeps you from having to deal with the reality of your own sin? Or do you have a false neutrality, of pretending that you can ride the fence on all these spiritual matters and you don't have to take a stand on anything that, that is of real importance, 
which in reality all Christians really have to take stands in this day and age about what you believe and what the Bible says. Well, the rest of the story is very significant. Verse 7 tells us that the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. So we read that the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar after she had been run off by Sarah. But the angel told her to return. And then in verse 11, we see that uh, the angel of the Lord said that you're not with child, you'll have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your misery. And then... Um, informing her that this son that she would have would actually be the start of a whole new people, a whole new nation, a people who would be in conflict with the world. He'll be a wild donkey of a man, verse 12 says. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Then in verse 13, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. So, Ishmael then would become the, the father of the Arab race. You know, the Arabs and the Jews have been at each other ever since this time. The Arabs have always been more of a nomadic people, you know, wanderers and outcasts, angry, bitter, and rebellious. A race that arose because of the sin and unfaithfulness of Abraham and Sarah. And so this conflict, this enmity between Hagar and Sarah would increase when their children would grow up. Ishmael and Isaac also had conflict, and it would continue with their descendants for generation upon generation, and is in fact the major source of global conflict to this very day. This conflict, caused by the self-sufficiency of Abraham and Sarah, is symbolic of the spiritual conflict going on for all of us, because we have tampered with God's will by falling into sin. And as a result, we have been cast away from His presence, and we have become nomads without a home rebellious and angry and bitter. There is enmity between God and us because of this, because of our phoniness, our, our false superiority, our false spiritual interest, our false blame, our false neutrality. But there's wonderful news. Most scholars agree that when the Bible refers to the angel of the Lord, that it is what is called a theophany or an appearance of Jesus himself in his pre-incarnate form. I don't know if that's the case for sure, but it sure makes sense that it would. You see, Jesus, being God, existed even before he appeared on earth as a man. He could also very well have appeared in certain circumstances before he was born as a human being. And so I think it's very well likely that this was Jesus appearing to Hagar. And who did he appear to this time? It was to the outcast one, to the source of enmity and conflict. Uh, the name that is given to this child representing this rebellious nomadic people was Ishmael, which means God hears. And Hagar was able to recognize that this angel was actually the Lord, and she gave him her own name for him, which was the God who sees. So Christ appeared to her in her affliction and told her the way that she should go. He showed her what his way really was because he hears and because he sees. See, God wanted Hagar and Ishmael to know that he hears them, and he sees them, and he understands their situation. He wants to comfort them and to include them in his eternal plan. See, this story is really all about Jesus and his plan of salvation for all people, Jew and Palestinian, North American, South American, Asian, European, African. It's all about Jesus and his plan to save all of us. The Apostle Paul uses this story to explain this important truth in the book of Galatians, starting in chapter 4, verse 22. He writes this, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants, one covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, 
and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who ne were never in labor. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. You see, Ishmael represents man's religion through self-effort, through trying so hard and try, just working so hard at obeying those commandments and doing the right thing. What Abraham and Sarah decided about Hagar was their own doing. It was their own plan. And therefore, it is said that Ishmael was born of the flesh. Religion in itself is just of the flesh. Now, Isaac, on the other hand, the child that would eventually be born to Abraham and Sarah, was all God's doing. And that was the only way that he could have been born. And that's why he is called being born of a promise. All of us are Ishmael. We are born of the flesh. We have fallen into that trap of trying to take things into our own hands, and as a result, we've been outcast. It's our own doing. But salvation, that's God's doing. Jesus has appeared to us with the message that he hears us, and he sees us, and he understands us. He offers us the chance to be Isaac, to be born of the Spirit or the promise. And all it takes is faith in his power to do that. God's way of doing things is the best way. It's the perfect way. Any other way then is false. And if we make ourselves think otherwise, then that just turns us into phonies. For anyone who has ever gone their own way instead of going God's way and who is suffering the consequences of that, or, or perhaps for anyone who is a victim of someone else's choice to disobey God, the message is the same for you. God sees you. God knows you. God loves you. Twyla Parrish wrote a song that, uh, that, that speaks to this. It's for every heart that is breaking. And the words say, For the young abandoned husband, left alone without a reason. For the pilgrim in the city where there is no home. For the son without a father. For his solitary mother. I have a message. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. Every heart that is breaking tonight is the heart of a child that he holds in his sight. And oh, how he longs to hold in his arms every heart that is breaking tonight. For the precious fallen daughter, for her devastated father, for the prodigal who's dying in a strange new way, for the child who's always hungry, for the patriot with no country, I have a message. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. Jesus loves you. Every heart that is breaking tonight is the heart of a child that he holds in his sight. And oh, how he longs to hold in his arms every heart that is breaking tonight. Let us be children of the promise. We need God to work that same miracle in us that he did for Abraham and Sarah to make us children of faith, born of the Spirit and not of the flesh. Christ wants to receive us, sinful as we are, and God knows best. We just need to trust him and his way. Are you trying to do things your own way instead of trusting in God's ways? If you are, then God wants to show you his way, the way of faith, the way of responding to his promises, the way of obeying his commandments, not out of some way to earn our salvation, but out of way of, of showing that we accept his salvation and we want to love him by receiving Jesus Christ as our own Savior and Lord. It's not an expedient way. It's not always expedient. It's not always convenient. It's not always easy, but it's always best. Is there anyone here that would like to receive Christ as your own Savior today? Would you come forward as we sing the hymn of, of what the Christian life is all about? It's about trusting. It's about obeying. As we stand together and sing, please come forward. Anyone else who would like to join the church, you too are invited to come forward as we sing. Let's